Uh, title of my message is Our Lifesaver. A thing that saves one from serious difficulty is what defines a lifesaver. Have you been in a life or death situation and someone was there to save your life? Now, there is one particular job where they are specifically trained for that task, making sure that everyone is safe. And when lives are at stake, they are there to save them. This is where lifeguards step in. Lifeguards assume a huge responsibility of keeping swimmers safe. According to the International Life Saving Federation reports, certified life, uh, uh, sorry, certified life savers and lifeguards rescue over one million lives each year. In California alone, the California State Lifeguards perform approximately 10,000 water rescues each year. And according to the United States Life Saving Association, the USLA, the stats tell us that the chance of a death by drowning at a beach protected by lifeguards is one in 18 million. One particular lifeguard, I don't know if you ever heard of him, his name was Leroy Colombo from 1905 to 1974. He was a lifeguard who was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records for saving 907 lives from drowning between 1917 and his death in Galveston, Texas. However, some reports say that he had saved over a thousand people. If that wasn't amazing enough, what was even more remarkable was that he became deaf when he became, or when he suffered spinal meningitis when he was seven years old. But that didn't stop him. Being deaf might have disqualified him for lifeguarding under certain circumstances, but Leroy's deafness seemed to make him even better at his job. When he was on the beach of Galveston Island, his eyes scanned the water constantly. The sound of the surf, children playing, seagulls cawing did not distract him. Having grown up blocks from the ocean, he knew the tides and the currents so well that he could sense any alarming disruption in the water. Simply put, he was one of the best lifeguards ever. Now, have you ever been saved by a lifeguard, especially at the beach, when you go out into the water too far, get stuck in a riptide, for example? Now, this seems to be a common thing, having been saved sometime in life by a lifeguard, either at the pool or at the beach, or at least been told what not to do when swimming and been directed where to swim, especially at the beach. You know, surfers have their turf, so you don't swim where the surfers go. I'm sure everybody has been in that situation when a lifeguard comes over to you and tells you, go over to the right, go to the left. So, at least for me personally, that's happened many, many times. <laughs> but there are plenty other, of other occupations where life-saving plays an important role. And doctors, firefighters, law enforcement, who are physical lifesavers, who provide physical protection. But none of them can provide spiritual protection, and only one can do that. For those who haven't been in a physical life-saving situation by an individual, has your life not been saved in some other way? For example, 1 Peter 3.21 1 Peter 3.21 we read, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism. It was saves us. Mark 16 verse 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But... He who does not believe will be condemned or judged. But there is much more to the meaning of being saved. What does that actually mean? We turn over to John 3 and verse 5. John 
explains this in more detail. John 3, beginning verse 5. Most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit... It's a great analogy. We know the wind exists, but we can't see it. The wind is invisible to human eyes, but it is filled with great power, just like the Holy Spirit. If you want the Holy Spirit in us, we need to be baptized. Further, verse 15, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Again, he says the same thing. Verse 16, the most famous scripture in the world. He who believes, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But there's more to just believing. What does that mean? Look at verse 21 of chapter 3. He who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Being saved is believing, and believing is doing. We dismissed our old ways, our old way of life, and received a new body, a righteous way of life at our baptism, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. See, their time, or their time of salvation hasn't even come yet. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, verse 21, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be re renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. How do you get rid of the old man to become a new man? Baptism is required. And what we put away is explained in verses 25 to 31. Putting away lying, anger, stealing, corrupt words out of our mouths. A lot of these are the Ten Commandments, right? These are the old ways that we are to get rid of. And if you see verse 32, we replace it with this, being kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then continuing on in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. God is righteousness. He is the truth. He is perfect in all his ways. And yet we read right here that we are to be imitators of God. What has God given us that would save our lives? Well, we've been reading for this from this very famous book here. Obviously, it's God's word. It's the Bible. How will our lives be saved? Notice Luke chapter 9 and verse 24 and 25. Luke 9 verse 24. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Verse 25, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? In other words, putting our confidence in the world on material things will profit us nothing in the end. Man will not live forever. 
And you can have much success in the world, which isn't a bad thing. But if you forget about God, you will lose all you have. And then what? Notice 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. First Peter 1, verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but incor incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because, verse 24, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of the grass. What happens to the grass? It withers. It's flowers. The flower falls away. But, verse 25, the word of the Lord endures forever. All scripture in this book is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, for training, for discipline, in righteousness, that we may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. It doesn't get more blatant than that. The Bible is useful for teaching and helping people and for correcting them and showing them how to live. Have we ever given someone something that could save their lives? Is this not the job of the church? Are we not lifesavers? Do we not offer life saving and advice or life saving advice to the world as a witness through the preaching of the gospel and to proclaim the warnings of what is to come? The booklets that we produce is valuable information that goes in line with the Bible yet explaining in ways which benefit an understanding. They are our study guides, our life-saving devices to teach and to prepare us for what the future will bring. The important thing is what we do now, which also determines our future. What role do we have in the church? Do you love this church? Do you love the truth? Do you love doing good? being a good example? You never know who you're going to meet, how God can actually use you for a specific purpose. Someone who is genuinely or genuinely interested, whom God may be calling, may ask you about your beliefs and you may and may just ask you for a booklet. For example, what I talked about today. Baptism, a requirement for salvation and the gospel of the kingdom of God. Someone may ask you a question about this and want, like to know more. Here you go. You got a booklet to give them. That's all I have to do. And who knows? You may just have saved their life. 